We're tight on time, guys. So, uh, Katie, I'll start with you. Hi, hey, Mary Adams. How are you? Good, thanks. I wanted to ask you a question uh, based off my colleague, Yoel Golden's story last night about um, your apartment at the Kiever Place in Brooklyn. Mm -hmm. Right. Um, it's a two-part question. Why did you live or at least pay rent at the McKeever Place apartment from 2013 to 2017 when you owned a four-unit townhouse nearby? I went. It's very nice. And also, when you were at the apartment, who else lived there with you? Well, uh, uh, first, um, there were a... I lo always lived in Brooklyn. Always voted in my locale where I registered for. And there were some public safety issues that caused me uh, to be concerned about being on Lafayette. And I'm not going to go into details of that, uh, but uh, there were some public safety issues. And who else lived in the apartment oh, when you Sorry, I'll there? come back. Uh, I'm, not, I'm not going through the, the, my roster who live in, in houses, you know. <laughs> I'll, if we do follow-ups, I'll come back to you guys, but let's just try to get to everybody. Steve, go ahead. Good morning, Mayor. How are you? Good. Um, talking about the budget, the Comptroller has expressed a lot of concerns, along with a bunch of other lawmakers, that this will impact your ability to get stuff done. If 50% of all vacancies are going to go unfilled. Uh, basically, what, what is the rationale behind this budget, and can you still get city services done at the pace they need to get done? Okay, what's, what's very interesting, and I could be wrong, but I have to check on it. I believe we have a 6% citywide vacancy rate, um, the, uh, the mayor's office. I believe the controller has a 17% vacancy rate. And so if he's stating with my 6%, I'm going to have a problem doing services. What is he going to do with 17%? And he also has people who are working from home remotely. And so I, I just think that he needs to focus on his office and delivering services because there's a lot of services he must do. We are dealing with, with a multi-billion dollar budget. When I ran for office, I use the term PEGS, Program to Eliminate the Gaps. I stated that we have to deliver a better product by using taxpayers' dollars better. I am keeping my campaign promise. I, I believe that inside our agencies, we have to find efficiencies. We're going to do everything we can to find those efficiencies to find the best cost saving as possible, and then we're going to move to plan B and plan C to deal with this budget gap. December is going to come out with our tax uh, uh, receipts. That's going to make a real decision on what else we must do. These are real difficult days, and I don't know if people really realize that. I was reading one of the articles where somebody said, well, we, we're just posturing. I, I wish I was just posturing. We are in financial trouble, and the country's in financial trouble, and I have to be financially prudent uh, to make these smart decisions. Go ahead, Steve. Go ahead. You mentioned the campaign. Oh, oh, go you got, you, wait, hold on. You got, you got to give him two. I, I just yeah. like this guy. Okay. <laughs> Thank you. Right, you mentioned campaign promises. One campaign promise was cutting the NYPD's overtime budget in half. The opposite has happened. It has gone over what it was at that point. Is there any bloat within the NYPD that is worth tackling? I know they're immune from these budget cuts. And, and they're not completely immune. Um, we're doing it in layers, and, you know, we have a crime surge uh, 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 that we must address. A lot of patterns uh, that we must address. Uh, we made an amazing arrest last night. We believe it's going to close down one of our patterns. Uh, voters tell me every time, when I'm on the trains, when I'm on the buses, when I'm walking the streets, uh, they are concerned about crime. And the omnipresent of a police officer uh, assists that. We have been successful in decreasing homicides, decreasing uh, uh, shootings, uh, decreasing felonious assaults. Uh, we're seeing a trend where we're decreasing in some of those crime with repeated offenders. We have to keep doing the right things, and once we can stabilize this ship on what I believe was some of the problems we had in the past, uh, then we can look at really digging into uh, bringing back some of that over time. But right now, I have to make sure the city's safe. Um, good morning, Mr. Mayor. How are you? Good. I wanted to ask you about Crypto. Yes. There's been a lot about crypto in the news. It's lost something like over a trillion dollars. Yes. Um, one of the biggest companies has imploded. You mm -hmm. were one of the big supporters and believers in this industry. Do you have any regrets about that? And what do you think? Is there, do you think that the city should still be promoting this industry? 
Well, uh, first, um, I believe in technology. The whole thought of using crypto blockchain, uh, 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 currency, uh, what you call it, cyber wallets, uh, we need to move into this space. This space is coming if we like it or not. And when I hear people say, well, look how much money uh, an individual lost uh, in uh, cryptocurrency, uh, I, you know how much money I lost in the stock market? You know, uh, with some of my retirement investment, I'm afraid to even look at it nowadays, you know. All of these industries have ups and downs. Um, you know, the junk bond kings, the fraud that they did in the stock market and, and penny bonds. and You know, so there's always people who are going to exploit these forms of industries. I believe in the new markets and the new currencies, and I'm encouraging my young people to learn about them. We had a, a crypto summit um, that was uh, partnered with the owners of um, the New York Nets, uh, where we brought young people in to learn about these industries. These industries are not going to go away because they reach low points. This is an industry that we must embrace, and I'm looking to further leaning into uh, blockchain and other technologies. Yes, my, my money's already there. I took my first three paychecks. Mr. Mayor, yes. good morning. Have you received approval for state or federal aid for the $1 billion library crisis? Uh, no. Still, you know, we're still in uh, conversations, um, and we, we're going to have a plan A and a plan B. That's, that's how I operate. Uh, you know, we need help. You know, we spent a lot of money. Uh, this was a national problem, and it was a state problem, and we need help from the state government, and we need help from uh, the national government. I'm, I'm sorry. Are you hopeful that you I, I'm always hopeful, you know. We say in the Baptist church, I'm prayerful. <laughs> uh, Mr. Mayor, just going off of that last question, that um, one billion that the city hasn't gotten yet from the feds was built into the November plan. The city council's been critical that that was put into the plan while they have identified one billion dollars in tax receipts that was not put into the plan. You mentioned tax receipts before. You know, what do you think of that criticism? I think that's, the, you know, that's the best part of this um, form of government. We have these checks and balances. We have these conversations. They have their fiscal uh, experts. I have mine and the team over there in OMB. Of, you know, we need to be prepared for the economic tsunami that is coming towards our city. No one is saying that is not true. They are saying uh, how do we get prepared, prepared for it. We're having conversations with that. But there's no one in the city council, fiscal experts, everyone is stated we're about to hit, be hit with a tsunami. Everyone is stating that. And so because we all agree on that, now we have to figure out how do we address it. And so if, they've, if December the tax receipts are better than what we uh, anticipate, uh, you know, the real estate uh, taxes, how they're going to impact that, the income taxes, uh, how Wall Street is doing, if they're better than what we anticipate, then we could adjust. But right now we need to be prepared. Uh, for the worst part of this tsunami. Thank you. Uh, following up on the on the budget question, um, you touched on this a little bit when Steve asked his question, but given that these latest rounds of cuts are exempting uniform uh, agencies, uniform positions, I'm wondering what type of message you think that sends to the other agencies, uh, many of which are already complaining about steep uh, staff shortages, <coughs> like HPD, which reports have revealed are suffering from such steep shortages that they're having a hard time even doing their day-to-day -day jobs. What type of message does it send to those agencies that the NYPD seems to get off the hook each time, and at what point does it become necessary to actually take a look at NYPD cuts? No, we are, we are Chris. We're looking at NYPD, sitting down with uh, the commissioner who's fully committed, uh, as I stated, uh, what we have uh, saved just in the parades this year. You don't see the parades that used to, the way they used to be covered uh, because we looked in and said, listen, we have to do a better job. Why do we have five cops standing on the corner just hanging out? Uh, we are utilizing and deploying police better. I said this on the campaign trail, and I will continue to say we, ha we had a deployment problem. But one thing we cannot ever compromise on, and that's safety. I said it over and over. Public safety is a prerequisite to our prosperity. That's our economic stimulus. If we are unsafe, we will not be able to survive as a city. 
And NYPD, just as any other agency, is going to be examined to make sure that they're using their dollars uh, correctly. So they're not all, no one is escaping. Escaping. We're going to do it in a levels that is not going to hurt the delivery of services and the safety of the city. Two more. Uh, yeah, Jeff, go ahead. Uh, good morning, Mayor. What's up, Jeff? Did you or anyone in your inner circle put in a good word for Lisa White or help her get hired uh, in that deputy commissioner position at the NYPD? Uh, DCPI handles um, those questions. NYPD handle the handle the personnel. But all of my agencies, uh, we know we put in. We, we say you got to get the best people for the job, and we've we've done that. We've been successful in doing that. Last question. Go ahead. Okay. So uh, coming back to the domestic violence, I yes. also spoke to another survivor who's talking about culturally competent counseling. What's it called? Culturally competent counseling. Yes. Mm -hmm. uh, that's one. Second, sometimes. Um, as victims of domestic violence, we we have a feeling that we have to throw somebody under the bus mm -hmm. to get the services that we need. And we know uh, the impact of mass incarceration in black and brown communities. So when it comes to domestic violence, instead of thinking about jail or uh, the DAs, is, is the city also thinking about providing support to the abuser? Because in domestic violence, there are two victims, the most recent one and the one that whose trauma was unaddressed. Yeah, studies have shown that uh, a person who is an abuser uh, uh, may have come from a growing up in a household who was, where abuse exists. And what you see today, as you walk through here, this is an evolution. It wasn't always this way. My mom didn't have this. Uh, the families on the block didn't have this. And so it's a constant evolution. And we're also partnering um, uh, with those organizations and groups who are coming up with new good ideas, like uh, culturally competent, uh, you know, counseling. And we're, we're open to that. Everyone wants to get this right. And it's not about abuse. It's not about trying to criminalize anyone. It's about creating a safe environment uh, for the family. This is a complicated conversation because when, when families are in the, in the midst of an imminent danger to a family member, we must respond. We cannot, we have to remove that danger right away and then, then get the assistance that's needed to help that family become whole. We want to keep families together, but we also must protect family members. And I cannot tell you, I responded to a lot of domestic violence incidents as a police officer. It's a tough, tough call to make. It's a tough call to make. But one thing is for sure, you can't get it wrong. Thank you. Thanks, guys.